Hello and welcome back. My name is Robert Levingston and I'd like to thank you for joining us again and studying God's Word. About a year ago we put a post up in relation to what happens when you die. Well, there's been more and more activities online totally disregarding what Jesus said or distorting it and there's a movement that's creeping up again and it's, it's nothing new but it's creeping up now it's called soul sleep. In essence this doctrine says that when you die you go into the grave until Jesus returns. Is that something that Jesus professed? We're going to look at scriptures and, and we will make a determination after this. Welcome back. Once again, the soul sleepers believe and we'll refer to them as soul sleepers, that once a person dies, he goes into the grave until Jesus' second coming. And then at that time, he's resurrected. But is that what the scriptures say? I'm not going to go through all their scriptures and the way they distort them, but I'll name a couple of them that they reference. Uh, Daniel 12.2, Genesis 3.19, and Ecclesiastic 2.7. And Daniel, sleep in the dust. Return to the dust, what Genesis says. Return to the dust, Ecclesiastics. In other words, when you die, everything is in the grave. Your body, your soul, everything is there until Jesus returns. The body, man, has a many trinity. We have a body, physical body. We have a spirit and a soul. Jesus tells another story. Let's look at uh, Luke 22 through 31. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, or also Abraham's bosom, which is also referred to as paradise. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. In other words, it's torment. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Beside all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Abraham, he said, 
it's someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. So, and, and you can read the rest. In essence, when Abraham said, if they won't listen to him, they won't listen to someone from the dead. In other words, they're set in their ways and they're stubborn. Now, <clears throat> the soul sleeper says, their view of this particular event that Jesus mentioned is a parable. And the conventional thought is, it's not a parable that it's events that actually happened. Now, if you include this, Jesus taught from 45 parables, if you include this as a parable. No, 46, if you include it as a parable. In this particular parable, unlike any of the others, Jesus mentioned the name Lazarus. He didn't name the rich man because actually he, he was lost and he really wasn't worth mentioning his name. But he also gave a detailed description of what hell was. It was a place of torment. In essence, conveying a message that you do not want to go to hell or Hades. And he also mentioned Abraham and Abraham's bosom. Well, Abraham lived. So he mentioned Abraham, which wasn't a fictitious, fictitious person. And he's going to list, he's going to make up a name, Lazarus. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus said, not in this particular instance, if I didn't say so, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't have said so. He also, there's another message from here that Hades is a place of torment. And when you die, you will remember your life. This man remembered his brothers and the life that he had. And Abraham reminded him. Verses, Jesus lays down a foundation of what happens when you die which is basically dismissed as a parable by the soul sleepers. In the next few minutes, we're gonna go over scriptures that build upon this foundation of this event that Jesus describes, okay? Let's go to Luke 23, 43. And this is the, while Jesus is on the cross dying, one of the thieves beside him asked Jesus to remember him when he gets in the kingdom. He, at that point of death, understood that Jesus Christ was without sin and that he was the son of God. Now, there's other message points that come out of this. It's so deep because there are people or doctrines that believe the only way you get saved is you get submerged in the water. Well, this debunks that. Much like the soul sleepers, it gets twisted. Jesus answered him and, and said, truly, I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. And what we said about paradise, paradise is Abraham's bosom. Scriptures describe it as being down in the earth at this point. Hades or hell along with paradise is down in the earth. But when Jesus dies, He's saying, we're gonna be in paradise. You're gonna be in paradise with me. Well, let's find out what Jesus does when he goes to paradise. First, let's look at Luke 4.18. This is an indication of what he's gonna do. 
This, and this is Jesus talking. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind, set, set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, who are the captives? To proclaim liberty to the captives. Those are the people that are currently in paradise. And also, this is the belief of what we've had and what he's indicating in Luke 18 that he's proclaiming liberty. In other words, death is defeated. Just as it was proclaimed that Jesus would defeat death and be handed the keys of life and death. That's what, what he did when he descended. Is that all he did? No, let's go to 1 Peter 3.19. The Bible says the following, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. They were not sleep in a grave. They were in Hades or in paradise. So he preached to the spirits. In other words, letting them know those that are in paradise, you're free now. You, the veil has been rent. The sacrifice has been made. Listen, Luke and Matthew had talked, the gospels talked about the veil being rent once Jesus was crucified. In other words, that separation between man and God had been removed. The sacrifice of Jesus represents the sacrifice for all mankind if they accept him, which meant at that point, if you died, once this process is cleared, instead of going into paradise, you would go to heaven. Also, what did Jesus do when he went down there after he preached? You mentioning removing the saints. Let's go to Matthew 27, 52 and 53. And the Bible says, and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection Jesus came first and then he, the saints and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now note that those bodies were raised, but it didn't say that those souls came from, in other words, the souls came from the grave. The bodies did. Those that slept, those bodies, their souls and spirits returned to them. In other words, you know, some people refer to them as zombies, but the case was they came back alive and were allowed to talk to believers. And the Bible isn't clear on what was said, but I believe that they proclaimed that Jesus Christ was King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that it had been fulfilled, the prophecies had been fulfilled. And we are now saved. Let's, and if that's the case, remember Jesus left, and when he went, he took those saints, along with paradise, with him to heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In other words, when you die, you either go on to Hades or you go to heaven. Not sleep in the grave until Jesus returns. You don't read anything into it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 
No, 5.1. And the scripture says, For we know that if our earthly house, our body, house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in heavens, in the heavens. And Jesus said he would prepare a place for us. Not that we'd have to go sleep in a grave. There's more. Jesus says that he would send the comforter for his believers. In other words, the Holy Spirit, so that we may have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What happens if we die? If we go to sleep in the grave, what's gonna happen to the Holy Spirit? He's not gonna sleep with us. He's gonna leave us there, although the Lord promised he would never leave us, that we would be sealed until the day of redemption, which means his coming. People still think that the saints will still sleep in the grave. Here's more evidence that that's not the case. Uh, Jude 14, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 saints. Basically, when the Lord returns for the rapture, he's bringing saints with him. And when he has his second coming, he's bringing saints with him. They're not asleep. He's bringing them with him. Uh, Revelation 20, 13, Jesus says the following. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what they had done. Did you listen? Did you hear what it was said? Death and Hades, hell, gave up the dead that were in them. Persons, persons were in them. Now the bodies were where? In the grave. But according to this doctrine, the not only the bodies, but the souls are in the grave. No, they're not asleep. They were in Hades, in torment, just like Jesus said about the rich man. He is in torment, in the grave. Also, what's going to happen to Hades? Although they said Hades doesn't exist. They don't believe it. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This was, this is the second death. Remember, reminder that when Jesus died, Acts 2.31 says the following. He seeing this before he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. It says was not left in hell. Jesus descended and preached or declared liberty. Neither his flesh did seek corruption. In other words, his flesh did not rot. If the people that die go to the grave, remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Who was there? Now we know Elijah and Enoch were the only two saints that did not see death. Moses was there. Moses was there with Elijah to be sleeping in the grave. Because at that point, Jesus had not been sacrificed. And Moses was there. If you read in Jude, we know Moses' bones had been, his body had been deteriorated to bones because Satan contested with an angel for his bones. Anytime someone says something that's contrary to what the Lord intends it for, the Holy Spirit should light a fire in you to say, wait a minute, that does not sound right. Now, you say, uh, Brother Levingston, hold on. That's, but that's not going to keep us out of heaven, is it? It shouldn't. We still believe that Jesus died for us. 
Well, it may, it may not. I'm not sure. That's between you and Christ. Because Jesus clearly laid out things that as Christians, number one, you should be his. He should know you. In other words, he should know you, your belief, your faith. Your faith will have you believe. What he says is not a lie. It's the truth. <clears throat> and if you say, well, I believe this, but not that. I believe this and not that. Then you're what is referred to in the book of Revelation 3.16 as lukewarm. And Jesus says, then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, <clears throat> where the churches were located, they had water, uh, warm springs, hot springs. And for medicinal purposes or for medication, they would drink the water hot the mineral water and if they went in the winter they would sit it out and let it get cold and they could drink it but for some odd reason if it was lukewarm a gag effect would come into place and people would throw up because you cannot drink that water lukewarm and so that's how he's referring to a lukewarm Christian and the worst thing that you could hear and the most terrifying thing if I'm a Christian is what Jesus says in Matthew 7:23 and this is starting at 22 he says many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. In other words, you can do this with, you can talk a good game, but you have to walk the walk. So if you believe that you sleep in that grave, then there's a chance that you don't believe what Christ says. We just laid it out. We just laid out a foundation and built on scripture what Jesus says, not leaving out anything. Understand this, don't just take my word for it. Don't just take someone else's word, some other preacher's word for it that sounds good. He sounds like he knows a lot. But if he says this, he's ignorant. He's one of two things. He is, he's ignorant and the Holy Spirit has not totally worked in him to see what he's supposed to see about what happens to us when we die or He's purposely doing it, and he's a special agent of Satan. Now, this is one of the most beautiful things about what the Lord has done for me. And it's just a little testimony. The majority of my life I spent as an investigator, working at the local level and the federal level, investigating crime, investigating the truth, not just speculating, not just arbitrarily, oh, this is why, ah, oh, this is, no, investigating facts. And they, this is what I do, and I enjoy it. And the Lord has blessed me with it. i like to thank you. I hope that this has been beneficial to you. Let's close with a prayer. Blessed Father, Father of all creation, we thank you, Lord, once again for allowing us to gather and study your word. We pray, Lord, that this word 
was beneficial, that it may help and assure some members of your body that have doubts or seeds of doubt planted and that this be a reassurance. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We give you all the honor and all the glory because you're worthy. These prayers we ask in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. 